Welcome to the Innovator Spotlight, a podcast featuring conversations with some of the most innovative leaders, designers, and technologists in biomedical engineering and the health sciences. I'm Sean Grace, and today's guests are Josh Leibowitz, Wes McDowell, and Ravi Patel, all senior R&D engineers at Johnson & Johnson's medical devices companies. And all three are also One Young World ambassadors, something we'll be exploring in today's episode. Welcome, guys. Good to be Thanks, here. Sean. Good Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's uh, great to have you here. Um, so I'd love to just uh, have each one of you um, do a little brief introduction, a little background, sort of tell about yourselves. You know, So Josh, why don't you start? You know, tell us a little about yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Josh Lee Woods. I'm a uh, biomedical engineer for Johnson & Johnson. I uh, originally grew up in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, and uh, left Florida to go to Boston University for an undergrad degree in biomedical engineering, and then followed that with a master's degree at Georgia Tech in product development. One of my favorite things to do is play tennis outside of work. And uh, mm -hmm. How long have you been with Johnson & Johnson? Um, I've been with Johnson & Johnson since 2017. So mm -hmm. I, I've rotated through our orthopedics business, and now I'm in uh, the neurovascular business at J&J. Gotcha. Ravi? Yes, so my name is Ravi Patel. I did my undergraduate degree at Stony Brook University, uh, studying biomedical engineering, and then I went to Cornell University to do my master's in mechanical engineering, uh, where I got to work with NASA for the year and kind of trying out some of my more interesting life pathways I wanted to try out at some point in life, but uh, I found out that when it comes to the mission to Mars, it was, everything was in the future, and I wanted to join a company that's doing stuff in the present, and I couldn't think of anyone better than Johnson & Johnson for that. And a little bit about myself is, I like tutoring when I get the time. Uh, just seeing a child learn something for the first time, or at least have something click in their mind is something that fuels me, so when I get the chance after work, I help usually elementary kids' schools all the way up to college graduates. Nice. Wes? Yeah, so I'm originally from the Philadelphia area, Went to the University of Delaware for undergrad in biomedical engineering. Then went to Pittsburgh as well, also in biomedical engineering. Did an intern along with uh, Ravi here. Then I kind of rotated around from trauma to Depew. Um, so that's from the Synthes franchise to the Depew franchise. So going into orthopedics, and that's where I landed right now in Warsaw, Indiana. I do work for as a product development engineer on the Robony platform. It's a robotics device for knee orthopedics, which is pretty cool. Very futuristic and modern day stuff, which is what I really wanted to get into. And the LDP program was able to get me through uh, a lot of CAD work and then also a 3D printed structure that was done in a clean room and then transitioned to robotics. So it's been really cool to be a part of a lot of frontline stuff. And I've been here as long as Ravi has for about two, two and a half years. So what was the most important factor that influenced you to choose the RDLDP program uh, at J&J &J, instead of maybe somewhere else in, in some of the other disciplines and companies that, that may have interested you? Josh? So, yeah, so what attracted me most about uh, the rotation program at Johnson & Johnson, the RDLDP, was um, the ability to rotate in three different roles over a two-year period. So coming out of a master's program, uh, I knew I was very passionate about product development, but I wasn't necessarily sure what area or what unmet need I wanted to focus on. So um, by joining three different projects across um, the research and development platform or product development platform, um, I was able to join different projects at different time points, um, explore each phase of a project. So um, what excited me most was the opportunity to learn different things uh, Across, across our medical device platform. So I started in trauma, went to neurovascular and worked both on the ischemic stroke side and hemorrhagic stroke side. And then during uh, those different rotations, we also incorporated a lot of leadership development um, components as well and a lot of intensive trainings where you got to take a step back from your technical day-to-day -day role and uh, learn more about yourself, uh, become more self-aware and also improve your leadership skills so that uh, you can go back to your team and make a meaningful difference with others and not just do it on your own and in an isolated bubble. You, it, takes, it takes an army to get a medical device from concept to uh, commercialization and into our hospitals. So um, you gotta work with people, you can't go through people. So um, this program helped 
help me become a better leader as well. Yeah, so true. You got to work with people. You can't go through people. Um, now, Ravi, you mentioned uh, a little bit in, in your intro about maybe uh, some of the uh, some of the reasons you chose. Could you uh, elaborate a little more? Like, what made you decide to join the uh, J and J program with RDLDP? Yeah, of course. So to back up to start with Johnson and Johnson at a high level, pretty much I read the credo back when I was in high, undergraduate, and the credo for those of you that don't know, which I'm assuming all of us know. Uh, is the backbone of Johnson & Johnson. It, what keeps us relevant, it's what keeps everybody motivated, and it's how we, how we keep ourselves relevant in this world. And so this credo had a line specifically towards helping the community. It's that we have a responsibility to not only the ones that we work with on a daily basis, but to the community in which we live. And that's something that resonated with me because a lot of the time I spend outside of work is to help that community and to have a company specifically write down that that's one of their pillars, uh, I knew that that's where I belong. And the rest is pretty much history because I joined the Leadership Development Program, a program that not only helps us develop as uh, R&D leaders, but a pro one that actually cares about you. And they invest in us, they help us become leaders in a way that's unique and special, not conforming to what society thinks a leader is. And to have a program do that for two years and even after the two years is something that made me want to come and I honestly has kept me here since. Wes, uh, give us some of the, maybe some of the reasons why you chose a J&J's RDLDP program. Sure. So back in grad school, I was looking at doing a postdoc. Uh, I had two offers from PhD labs, one back at Delaware and one in Pittsburgh, the one that I was actually volunteering in. I was really between you know, industry and, and doing a PhD at this point, but student loans were a big thing for me as I kind of made the decision that I need to put all my eggs in one basket because I was splitting efforts between a future in, as a PhD student or future in industry. And I actually went to a, a dinner actually, and he, I had like an interview, like a fake interview with someone. He was actually a financial advisor, so he had nothing to do with engineering. But he was like, if you want to put your future into something, you need to have no plan B because like right now you're splitting your time and you really need to focus on one. So if you're gonna go in industry, you need to prepare a lot better and you need to update your resume because this is like what you would do for an academic resume. It's like, like dude, you're totally right. So put all my eggs in the, in the basket, walked in the door of the career fair, ready to go. I talked to GE first, um, applied there, and then I talked to the J&J &J booth guy. And he was super cool. He actually went to the University of Delaware uh, they were hiring... The same guy as Robbie, right? Yeah, right? Same <laughs> GD guy. He got you here, too. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was funny because he was working as a mechanical engineer, so not biomedical, and it was on the Tylenol line. And I was like, well, I'm not a mechanical engineer. I don't really care about Tylenol, although it's a great product. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm really looking for biomedical, like orthopedics, and stuff like that. So he told me about all this stuff that J&J &J does that I didn't know because we're more than Band-Aids and baby powder. Something that I really wanted to do was look at multiple positions and not just be stuck in one because I have a lot of friends who went into industry as sales or as technicians or as a PD engineers or quality engineers and they've kind of flip-flopped companies a couple times so being able to do that internally within J&J has been a real blessing to be honest so really happy I landed here. So when did you first decide to pursue engineering? So my background on that was in high school I took a CAD class and it was actually technical drawing one it was labeled and then they made a technical drawing too and I was really good at it we had like three different kinds of pencils with different thicknesses and you do blocks and iso diagrams and all that kind of stuff and I signed up for tech drawing too and I walked in and Mr. Patton was his name he looked at me and said Wes you know, what are you doing here you already took this class and I was like what do you mean but I, was like, I was like you called it tech tech drawing too. I like, no, it's the same class. We just have like the second session of it in like the spring or whatever. And I was like, ah, oh, what do I do? And he was like, well, I'll give you like more like intricate designs and bolts and threads and stuff like that. So I started doing all that and I took him, we did, we took apart a lawnmower motor and put it back together. I took him for rocketry, but he was like, you should really be an engineer. And I, I really liked the guy. And I loved the class. And I was like, all right, man, like I'm just going to be an engineer now. And that was when it kind of clicked for me. Boy, you know, the influences of uh, good high school teachers are really, really so powerful. Ravi, when did you decide to pursue engineering? Pretty much it was back when I was a kid. I knew I always had an interest because 
the stuff I found most interesting was when I watched my grandfather walk around the house. And a lot of this came in the, when something was broken and we didn't necessarily have the money to go buy a solution right away from Lowe's or Home Depot. What do you mean walk around the house? Woo. Pretty much throughout the day he walked around and looked for stuff that's broken or stuff that he doesn't like the way it's working right now. <laughs> and so because of that, when I come home from school or just throughout the day, I see him tinkering around. Uh -huh. And so he's making all these bizarre solutions for things I didn't even know were broken. He was doing this to make sure everything in our lives were easier because he saw that this could be a nuisance for us. So mm -hmm. he took the time to make sure we didn't have that nuisance, even though that meant more work for him. Mm -hmm. And so that initially began my thought process for building and designing. Um, but when I got to high school and we took those aptitude tests and where, what I should be when I'm older, I got a chef. I'm like, oh, that's great. I love food. <laughs> and then I went to my mom. She's like, yeah, that's, your food's not great when you make it. So, <laughs> so I, I got a harsh Thanks, reality mom. check early on. <laughs> but I looked into biomedical engineering off a whim. I, went to, I grew up in Illinois. I took a road trip to New, York, to New York over in Long Island and went to Stony Brook University to meet some of the professors because uh, someone had told me, hey, why don't you just check out this SUNY school out east? Mm -hmm. And I met this one professor, Dr. Judex, who ended up being my research advisor for three years. And he was working on this project, which was turning stem cells into bone cells on Q, which was very interesting because I always thought that the body is the way it is. You can't force it to do something else, especially when you're doing it in a lab. And so watching him vibrate cells and tell them, and somehow the cells are like, all right, I'm going to turn into a bone cell. And it was fascinating to me. And so I, no matter what school I applied to, um, that kept resonating in my mind. So I ended up going to Stony Brook, and the rest was learning more and more about engineering. And then instead of biomedical, I got really interested in mechanical because I loved heat and mass transfer and thermodynamics and fluid mechanics of how all the physics laws and principles govern everything we see. And so that led me to do more masters, and eventually I went to Cornell, where I did do astronomy-related work, which I'm glad I did. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> it's a but long it, story, but I enjoyed the path I took, and I could say it all kind of started with my grandfather back when I was little. Very interesting. Josh, uh, what, uh, what made you interested in engineering early? So I came from... Um, a family where my parents were both in the medical field. Uh, my dad is a physician and my mom was a uh, neonatal ICU nurse. So at a young age, I was always kind of fascinated by uh, what their careers were like. Uh, going into like middle school and high school, I um, started working on quite a few uh, science fair projects. And um, my first one was which popcorn pops the fastest. You know, <laughs> it, you know, a lot. we <laughs> had a lot of controls in there about like monitoring the microwave temperature. So I'm looking back on it, I'm proud of my, proud of myself for thinking about stuff like <laughs> Did that. Did you really? But, yeah, um, I allowed the microwave to cool before putting in the next bag to wow. prevent temperature bias. But so what was your hypothesis? <laughs> now we're getting a little too deep. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember that part, but. Um, the, funny enough, the next year was which uh, mouthwash is most um, effective at killing oral bacteria. So we took it up a notch. And, how'd, you, uh, how'd you do that? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, you know, I ordered I ordered materials from Carolina Biological, and uh, I worked. I worked. Uh, how old were you? He was seven. I was, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I just uh, started walking. Just pulled out the credit card. Um, and <laughs> wop wop. No, but because uh, these buy days are buying Fortnite stuff, and he's over here buying mouthwash for science <laughs> fair. <laughs> well. Um, as, as I got a little bit older and wanted to learn more about, you know, my passion for science, um, I realized that there were a couple of different avenues I wanted to go down. And um, the first was that I saw, I saw what my, my parents did as um, health, like healthcare providers um, of, the, of various levels. And uh, I was really passionate about finding a way to help people feel better. And that kind of resonated for me in uh, 12th grade when I took a trip to uh, Mount Sinai uh, Hospital in New York City, as well as NYU Medical. And I was with 35 um, high schoolers that were taking full-time classes at Florida Gulf Coast University. And I took a class through their honors program there that was called Organ Donation and Transplantation. So it was run by a, a nursing professor that um, had worked on a transplant unit and had lived that her whole life. And she was teaching us all about the transplant system, uh, how people get on the registry and on the list for an organ donation. 
And we, had, we were privileged enough to go to New York City for a week to go to those two transport transplant centers and observe. So I was one of the two luck, lucky individuals that actually got to witness a transplant occur. So I saw a brother donate a kidney to his sister. And I was uh, watching uh, behind the physician outside of the sterile field, standing there um, for hours. And mm. my legs were exhausted. I was like, I don't think I could be that doctor. <laughs> but it would be really cool to design those laparoscopic instruments. Mm. So that's kind of what sparked my interest in uh, helping make people feel better, but taking a different approach than what my parents had done uh, previously. So uh, as I got into university, uh, I still had pre-med in the back of my mind, but uh, when I started taking engineering classes and uh, learning all about the different applications that biomedical engineering could have and the impact that you could have on um, people, especially translational medicine, where you're taking research and actually applying it to make a meaningful difference, right. that was uh, the turning point for me in terms of uh, knowing that I wanted to work in the healthcare space, but taking that and actually making a difference in people's lives. Very cool. Um, now, all three of you were selected to represent Jane j uh, at the recent One Young World Conference in London. Can you share with us the experience participating in that conference? Robbie? Yeah, of course. It was, it was life-changing, to put it in a short way. Wow. It was something that I knew was going to be a powerful week, but I had no idea the magnitude of which it actually was. And so when we went there, we, there's a lot of talks that you can go to. There's a lot of people that you meet from international. So tell us just a little about what is the One a Young World Conference. Yeah. So the One Young World Conference, it's pretty much a global forum that was started about 10 years ago. Um, by two individuals that saw the need for us to start making changes relative to the world. This was ignited by all the things happening in the environment, all the inequality, um, all the different human rights situations that were present across the world. And they all coupled with the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And these goals are put in place so that we can bring this earth to a better place by the year 2030 uh, and do it in a way that's sustainable. So, not to sound grim, but the Earth potentially is on a, the ticking time clock here, where if we don't decide to act in the right manner when it comes to taking care of the place that's giving us life, then we might not have that place anymore in the future. And a lot of this conference was putting that realization uh, in all of our heads and also enlightening us and empowering us to be on the, in the forefronts of change telling us what we need in order to make things happen, learning from the top global activists that are actually doing this and acting in this world, and meeting with all from people from over, what, I think 190 countries were represented there, mm -hmm. over 2,000 individuals in London, all there to make sure change happens. And so you can imagine the energy and the attitudes and the sheer drive that was in one room at one time, and yeah, like I said, mm. life-changing. Wow, sounds amazing. Wes, uh, tell us a little about your experience there. Maybe uh, what was some of the more memorable presentations or encounters that you had there? Sure. So I didn't really know what to think going into it. I knew it was supposed to be kind of this life-changing thing, and everyone kind of keeps telling you that. You're like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, you've, you've heard that before. You know, you go to the movie. Someone said it was a really great movie, and you didn't think it was that great. Mm -hmm. Um but really, I kind of stepped off the plane, and London was amazing. Hooked up with some people from my group, and we walked around London for a bit. Got to see all the sites and stuff like that. London Eye, Big Ben. They're rebuilding all the buildings over there. But it was still, like, cool to see. So, like, right out the gate, great people from j and There was Brazil, China, Philippines, just everywhere. So that was cool, because you don't really see the scope of J&J &J in the workforce when you're kind of isolated to one spot, right. like trauma in Westchester or Depew Orthopedics in Warsaw, Indiana. So just meeting everyone was amazing. One of the things uh, that really impacted me the most was I sat down, they do this huge opening ceremony where they have all the sponsors come through corporate or government or otherwise and sat down next to this woman she was from the Philippines, started chatting. She actually went to college in the United States. 
And she said, you know, what, what company are you from? I said, well, I'm here representing Johnson & Johnson. She said, oh, that's so cool. So how many of, of you guys did they send? I was like, oh, well, there's, there were 65 of us there in London. She looked at me and she said, wow, I had to fight to be here. Wow. And I was like, wow, like, you know, it's kind of harsh to say to me. It's like the first thing, our first interaction. And I gave her the benefit of the doubt and just kind of moved on and looked past it for a second. She said, well, I had to fill out a visa letter. I had to go to my college in the United States and prove that I went there. I had to get my transcripts and I had to send those over. Whereas here I am just kind of stepping on a plane and just la di da over to, to England and mm-hmm. like not given a second care about it. There was no pre-work, no pre-check, nothing. Even though she was from the Philippines working as a petroleum engineer, which is a really smart profession, going to school in the United States, she had to go through all these hoops just to get there. Mm. Um, and that was kind of the first wake up call for me that was kind of like, whoa, right. like there's some really crazy stuff I'm about to learn. There was everything from people defecting from North Korea and talking about their experiences mm. to women in modern day slavery and like textile industry, uh, looking at how the environment is kind of collapsing and every second breath you take is from the ocean and those are getting bleached from the coral reefs and things are kind of spiraling out of control. Right. Um, wow. But really kind of gives you a kick in the pants. It's like, hey, you know, you, know you, you need to do something. It's kind of our time to act and brought really all 2,000 of us together, which was really cool. Wow, just incredible. Uh, Josh, anything in particular stand out for you at the conference? Yeah, it was, it was an incredible week. Uh, Every day seemed fuller than fuller than the next, and uh, when you really got a chance to get to know the J and J delegates through the different um, through the different activities of the week, as well as working with our partner organizations. So as part of uh, the program, we uh, we partnered. I was on a team of five uh, individuals that uh, were J and J employees, and we worked with um, an organization, Las Claras. Um, where we're helping uh, Alexandra um, further her organization in Panama. So I was working on a team with uh, folks from uh, the United States, Brazil, Chile, and Ecuador. So collectively um, getting to meet them in person and helping uh, further our shared goal of helping her nonprofit uh, make it through um, uh, the project that they were working on um, together, and it's running and completing uh, next month. So. Uh, to meet and partner and collaborate with people from J and J um, around the world and help this nonprofit in Panama was um, a really rewarding experience, and then, like I'm becoming really good friends with those people. And at the con- at the conference itself, uh, I think some of the biggest lessons that I that I took away is uh, that the time is now, and like no one needs to necessarily tap you on your shoulder and say, "Hey, you're you're capable of making a difference." and um, that wasn't something that uh, necessarily uh, reson- like resonated with me prior to the conference. Um, you know, if I wanted to start a nonprofit or I wanted to start a, um, a socially minded organization, I would think, oh, you know what, maybe I'll do it in a couple of years. But right. um, after listening to the speakers um, talk about their, their progress and what they're focusing on and whether it's the research or the actual organizations that they're running, uh, it was a wake-up call to me that uh, the time is now and that I can actually make a difference both within J&J and externally. Um, so mm-hmm. it, was, it was great to listen to them as well as uh, just in, interact, interact with everyone else there. Very cool. So based on your experiences at One Young World, in what ways were you inspired to action, whether towards your work or your socially-minded interests, in both the near term and, I don't know, maybe over the next uh, five to ten years. Wes? I was sparked by the Get Rid of Plastic initiatives that are kind of all over the world right now. Mm-hmm. J&J has done a fantastic job of beating me to my punch, everything I want to do. <laughs> so I wanted to get rid of the single-use cups at all the coffee machines, and they did that first, like immediately, right when we got back in October. Yep. And then I wanted to get rid of the silverware in the cafeteria, and then just this year, January like 6th, they got rid of all the plastic silverware in our cafe. Wow. And now it's all eco products, by uh, compo- compostable stuff. Mm-hmm. So they keep beating me to everything I want to do. So hopefully, <laughs> uh, hopefully I'll find something. I, I'm thinking about since it's very rural and farmland, I really wouldn't mind getting to 
put beehives on campus. We've got a community garden kind of thing too. So I think getting a community beehive would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. Ravi, what about you? I want to be able to put myself in a role where I'm able to bridge that gap that's existent between medical devices that we create for the developed world and the ones that we create for a developing world and do so in a way that everything I design will be targeted not just for the audience that can afford it, but for the ones that truly seek the value of it. And so putting myself in a position where I can make those strategic decisions uh, without being questioned a lot would be great. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Josh? Saranovis has begun over the last year or two to really engage with our community, going back to like what Ravi was saying about the credo um, and uh, being a helpful member um, to our community and having that responsibility. So I've been working lately on uh, creating STEM initiatives uh, for Saranovis to engage with and educate young students in uh, the Miami-Dade uh, County. What I want to do is really um, educate students about how they can get involved in STEM and encourage especially women to get involved in uh, STEM because I think that's the future and want to help, help stu uh, local people do that as well. Very nice. Well, listen, I want to thank you guys so much for spending time with me today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. The Innovator Spotlight Podcast is brought to you by Johnson & Johnson's R&D Leadership Development Program, cultivating tomorrow's innovation leaders in medical engineering and technologies. I'm Sean Grace. Thanks so much for listening.